श्री देवंदर मिस चंद्रकांता प्रोफेसर परमेश्वरन मिस्टर वरदराजन मिस्टर पंतलु मिस्टर नारायणन मिस भवानी ऑल द मेंबर्स ऑफ बी आई एस सदर्न रीजन लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन इंक्लूडिंग मेंबर्स ऑफ द प्रेस आई एम दी ऑड वन आउट ओवर हियर everybody else has got something to do with standards materials ensuring the economy of the state and the country improve you do something to the benefit of that yeah in my department where i served for 36 years both in tamil nadu as well as the whole country we have certain stations and certain units which were iso certified um the primary aim then was to see that there was no real tendency of work meaning investigations were done as and when the cases were reported the trials pushed through justice the justice rendered to the complainant ensure that there is security and peace in that station limits but that was something which was you know what somebody took it up as uh, something that they wanted to do one particular year and unless it was continued the next year it just kind of tapered out and so there wasn't really any crying need to ensure that every single station every single unit was iso certified mr devender has explained all about standardization why you need it and what it does for the economy I come to a different area that is the police. Just digressing a bit, what do the police actually do? Well, they have to maintain order. There is the prevention and detection of crime both in the real and the virtual worlds. There's regulation of traffic because that seems to be a point where everybody is an expert. and if i move on a little bit more we have to ensure the safety and security of every person in the community redress the grievances of those people who approach us and then very important there is the collection of intelligence in all matters affecting public order economic food and national security there's other jobs too but this in a nutshell kind of tells you exactly what the police do if i just move on to something i've taken out of the bis website of what exactly standards provide traceable and tangible benefits providing safe reliable quality goods minimizing health hazards to consumers promote exports and imports and control plur- uh, proliferation of varieties etc what is it that a service organization like the police does well they protect they keep everybody safe so that the rest can work towards the good of the economy good of the country I did a web search and came across seven principles for holders of public office which many in the audience and those on the stage definitely are and though it is not spelt out for all of us 
We do follow this because what are the principles? Selflessness, integrity and honesty, objectivity, accountability, an openness or transparency in work, and ultimately, leadership. I've just taken everything and kind of twisted it around to the work that I did all the years earlier, what the police continue to do. And I would like to term it as, who sets the standards for us? It really comes down to consumer satisfaction or the client satisfaction. And who's the client? The people we serve. So I call it expectation. And when one starts with expectations, I've just moved, I've just uh, listed out five of them. One is everyone wants to be safe, wants to have freedom from fear. Another one is they expect the police to be fair, to be courteous and respectful. Third is trust, trust between the police and the community. The next one is, therefore, working with the community. And all this would ultimately lead to customer satisfaction. Let me start with the first one, freedom from fear. What do I mean by this? I'd like to illustrate. When I worked in city police, both my illustrations come from there. When I was in city police, one August morning, we got a call from a lady who said that she had seen a young schoolboy who was cycling to school being abducted by somebody who had come in a van. The police followed it up and found that yes, the child had indeed been abducted while he was going to school. And what the lady had been able to see was a fact. It was, I mean, she was able to give us very little description of the van, etc. But she knew that two people had done this. No one else saw the abduction. Um, and had she not been on her balcony looking down, nobody would have seen and the parents would never have known that this child was missing till evening when he would have failed to return. In the school they would have presumed that the child was ill or something like that and therefore had missed school. The report is in the morning. By 11.30, all the, we started getting call after call from the Adyar area saying, is it safe for us to send our children to school? What are you doing about it? By the evening, the entire South, Chennai started asking us that question. Before night, we got many, many more calls. Is it safe? The only question asked is, is it safe to send our children to school tomorrow? We knew that there was just one thing we had to do, find the boy. Nothing else is going to remove that shadow of fear which seemed to have come down on this entire city. And so, the entire police working in those two districts of Adyar and St. Thomas Mount, as well as everybody in the southern region and the traffic police, kept aside all the other work they had to do and concentrated on this case. Traffic cameras everywhere were scanned to see if there was any description of this vehicle. We had patrol checks all over, we boxed in areas. We knew that 24 hours was all we had to find the boy. Anything later we were not, we could not guarantee his life. And the search went, the police went down practically every road 
not just in Adyar but even beyond. We just kept increasing circumferences so that we span out and check any idea where, whether the van which matched a particular description was seen around there. And then we started checking up with all petrol pumps and uh, mechanic shops about this particular van. Maybe it was our good luck. Maybe it was the fact that this noose was tightening. But the guys who had engineered this kidnapping, it was done by a member of the family for the very simple reason he wanted money off the father. They got scared. They felt that the police was closing in. So somebody brought the boy, released him about um, 100 meters or so away from his house, and he returned home safe and sound. Everybody was relieved. The next day, we never got a single call from anyone asking us, is it safe to send our child to school? And so we went on in this happy stage till the end of that year, when another little boy got kidnapped. This time, there was a phone call to his mother. She had just taken five lakhs as a loan for buying a flat. And she gets a call saying that if you don't give us five lakh rupees at such and such time, your son will be killed. They came, complained to the police. We started looking around that area. This is in the Virugam Bakam Saligramam area. And there was absolutely no sign that the child had returned home after playing with his friends out in the streets. We had people coming to the stations out there asking us just what is going on that our children are no longer safe playing outside. All that the police knew and we had all our stations working on it was that this little boy had been playing with three other friends as was their norm in the evening. They'd come back from school, finish their homework and at about 5.30 or 6 all these boys would gather and they would normally be playing on the streets. The street in where he lived, the street where another friend lived, etc. The only thing which could have been a little bit out of the norm was there was a film producer living somewhere opposite to this boy's house and somebody had come visiting. But even that, when we questioned the driver of the car, he said, no, there was nobody here. I mean, I saw the children play, but I saw him go out, but I don't remember seeing anybody coming back. Well, that's it. We continued the search. The other three boys who were his friends were also sitting with us, trying to help out. The parents were there. Several uh, well-wishers of the community also came to help. As 24 hours later, we still had no information. We were requesting members of the community, if they had seen any sign of him, please come and help us out. And as the next evening papers the body of the boy. He'd been killed, brutally murdered, in fact. His head had been smashed in using probably a stone or a brick. And now we had to find who'd done it. Again, calls started coming. You can't keep children safe. You're not able to see that people can play safely. Who do we trust? 24 hours more, we had the culprits behind bars. Even more unfortunate and tragic was the fact that the people who killed this little boy were those three friends who had been helping us the previous night. 
three children. And why did they do this? Because they wanted to buy the news telephone. They knew the mother had got five lakhs. They thought, let's get it out of her and buy cell phones. Because we were able to do our work, and we did the work because we worked 24-7, we were able to crack the case. And once that was done, everyone felt comfortable once again. Okay, they say congratulations, you've done a good job. But the main thing was, we know that perpetuators of such crimes are That's what I mean by freedom from fear. Just to know that the police are at work, they're moving around so that the person at home, the person at work, the person also moving in the public space is actually safe. The next thing I find on expectation is treatment at the police station or at any unit, wherever you go to. Now, it's very, very common and it's a must that whoever comes to the police station is treated with respect, courteously, and the treatment meted out is absolutely and completely fair. Fair enough. But let me tell you the side, the side of this whole thing. We find that most of the people come to us with a, they normally come with a grievance, they come with a complaint. And when there is a grievance or a complaint, it normally means there is another party involved. It can be a theft, it can be a quarrel, it can be some discord. But it always has one more person involved in it. The other strange part. The person who comes to give a complaint always wants the police to be absolutely harsh to the other party. At that stage, the whole idea of being courteous, respectful, no. In fact, a lady who come, a very respectable lady who come with a complaint that her servant girl had no proof about it, felt that the police was far too soft with the girl, saying that if you just gave her two thuppards, she would be able to tell you what is what has happened. The exact words were, but that is not the way things work. You can't do it. But this is the expectation. Very strange, but this is something we have to work through and then tell the person who comes to us, look, the way we treat you, we have to treat the other person. Until we know that they are guilty of something, after that the law will take its course. Now, unless the people trust the police, very little can be achieved. You can do everything because police is a service sector and in order to function, in order to work, you have to gain the trust of the people. I don't think any of you can imagine getting into an area to find all the people hostile to you. Hostile not because you've done something, Hostile because somebody else in Khaki had done something to them. When I was an ASP in what is now Velo district, I mean, it was the earlier North Arcot district, the spine of that district is the Javadi Hills. Uh, 
it's about 36 villages, mother villages, which span that entire area known as the Jawadi Hills and the uh, their headquarters or the main region is Jamna Marudur. Up there. If there were two sets of people they thought were the worst creatures on this world, one was the police, the other was the forest department. We both wore khaki. And when the chieftain, the Talami Natan, wanted to do anything. He would just come down to Alangayam, get to Vanyambadi, get onto a train, go to Delhi, and go and tell Mrs. Indira Gandhi exactly what was wrong with the place where, from where he came. He didn't believe in going to anybody else. We had a tough time because at that stage there was a lot of sandalwood smuggling. There was many other things which were happening there. And what we needed desperately was to be able to talk to these people. We had to gain their trust. <coughs> My subdivision, we managed that with the help of the entire district police because in those days we used to have something which is still there but which was very active, called the police public sports. So we decided in North Harcourt district, each of the six subdivisional officers had to hold the sports, and it became a kind of unwritten competition amongst each one. So my officers and me, we decided we will have ours up in Jamna Mardur for the tribals. Let's do it different. Speaking to them, we were helped out by the PET, a forest officer, and by Father Cadello, who, was, who had his little farm up there from um, the Sacred Hearts College down below in Tirpatur. The tribals distrusted us. They just didn't know what we were doing. The 32 Natans who had come and the Talimai Natan just kept saying, this is Pongal time, what are you going to do? We have got so many other things to do. So we said, no, we just want to hold the sports. It's between you and us, us as the police. They agreed. Then they said, we are bringing everybody. We said, fine. He said, you provide us food. That was a bit of a ask. It's not today, this is 1981, and things were vastly different out there. The local people of Tiruputur and Maniambari helped us out by giving food articles, by giving the prizes, by giving a lot of things so that we could organize this entire uh, jamboree, which we did. And It turned into a carnival. Every single man, woman, and child from those villages came for this particular jamboree. It took us two days to hold the, those sports because every event had more than a hundred people running. It was it was a wonderful experience, and I think because. The police, they saw the police in a different light. They saw them as hosts. They saw them as people who were actually cooking their food and serving it. They saw them as friends. Somewhere over the two days, we broke every barrier. And from that time onwards, the tribals up there have never, never felt that the police, where generations have passed, are anything but friends. It's this kind of trust that we need in order to do any work. It's always, it is always difficult to do work without, without trust. I'll give a second example. People always say that, you know, you, uh, if people come with complaints against your own department, against the police, you won't take action, all of you 
band together and you see that there is, you know, no justice given elsewhere. I had an instance where a young couple came to me and said that, what are you going to do with this problem we have? The husband hands me the wife's mobile phone and says, just see these messages. And yes, she was getting some messages which were definitely not the right type to get. It was very suggestive, all came from a man. And then I got a shock because I found that the perpetuator of this was an inspector. And the husband stood there and asked me, well, are you going to do something? I said, yes, I am. Why do you even think that I'm not going to do it? I called in my officers, they took the two of them and they said, we need a complaint from you. And we registered a case, we also arrested the inspector. Well, he knew he had done something wrong. Nobody interfered with us, although he was, he had enough influence to back him, but nobody interfered after that because the inspector had done the wrong thing. But for that young couple, it was absolutely important that their complaint was acted upon and acted upon the legal way. They knew then, yes, we can, we can trust these police, they will do what is required. When I come to working with the community, this is something which we call community policing. It's practiced by police forces the world over. In India too, it was something which is in vogue. If anybody sees our police standing orders, you will see that creation of village vigilance committees was very much part of the work of an inspector of police. This is something which has been there long before any of us were born or had joined the police. Here, the basic thing is that the local station has to be able to talk to the community. They have to listen to what they say. They have to understand what are the problems the people have. That means the station has to adapt to being a friend to every single person in the community, not just, say, the important people leaving aside those who are not important, not at all. To, you're a friend to every single person there. It then means that the station can gather the support of all the people when they require, when they need. And this is something which is so important for the police because it is the people living in far-flung areas who can tell you about, say, some strangers who have come there, of something that is different happening over there, something that is worrying. By the time the police move out there and find out what is going on, a lot of time would be lost. But if the people living in far-flung areas are able to do something, then it works much, much easier. Again, this kind of um, friendship that exists with the police and the community are coming together, working together, also does one more thing. All small problems can get solved. The little problems can be nipped in the bud. There's no need for going, making it a larger issue, going registering cases, etc. This helps. The community working with the police helps in prevention of crimes, which is important for us, which is important for both, both public and people then are working together. And what does happen is we get a lot of intelligence collected. In 2010, all the district police and the coastal security group 
worked on energizing these village vigilance committees in the various border villages of the state and the coastal villages. Over a thousand such villages were activated. There was an effort made to move out to all of them and it wasn't just the police alone. It was the revenue authorities, the health authorities, the education authorities, the forest authorities, the, the, the uh, fisheries department all came out to help out with this. Their problems we tried settling, mostly transport department had a lot to do with it, but this energizing of the villages all across the area, the only request we had from them was, if you see strangers in your area, please let us know. And almost immediately, as this was done, we got back the results. It was the time when there was a lot of information that um, Naxalites or people, uh, extremists were moving in from Andhra into Tien or from Karnataka into Tien. From a village in Velour, we were given this information. There's some strangers here and we have not seen them before. There were no more intrusions after that because forest and the police stepped up their work over there and knew exactly where people had come from. Similarly, there was a call to the uh, special branch inspector in Ramnath saying that there is a boat lying on the beach. We've just seen it now. There was an empty boat, a plastic boat as they call it the fiberglass boat and within the next 30 minutes there was somebody who called us from a religious place saying there are four strangers who are over here they don't belong to our place. Thanks to the help of the community we were able to pick up all these people and ensure that there was no problem whatsoever. So that brings me to the final thing, which is customer satisfaction. When, there, when all these expectations are met, we have a satisfied, safe and secure community. These expectations are not physical or quantifiable. It's just we know that if it's a satisfied community, then the police are doing their work properly. For an individual police officer or a constable, what matters is the capacity and the willingness to work. It doesn't matter who you are or where you came from. What matters is that you are there and you are ready to work. And most important of all, it doesn't matter to anybody whether you're a man or a woman. You're a constable or you're an officer and that is all that matters. And so I would say in keeping with the theme of the World Standardization uh, celebrations that these expectations, your standards, certainly level the playing field. I have great pleasure in inaugurating this conference and I hope that oh, the celebration, sorry, and I hope that you have a very, very fruitful year ahead and, and I'm sure you will all make a very, very big difference to our country. Thank you.